There are fascinating foreign policy events taking place, especially around the notion of Turkey and Erdogan. Finland and Sweden wants to be in NATO. Turkey is against this because it considers basically the PKK or the YPG to be terrorist organizations. However, Western leaders or Western countries actually have relationships with those groups. So the catch becomes, what is NATO going to be willing to give in order to assuage Turkey's concerns about those groups? And right now, Turkey is talking about an incursion into Syria. To have a conversation about this and what this means on the geopolitical stage, especially with Erdogan being this kind of kingmaker and with all of the hostilities that are taking place in the world, we're joined with the one and only Elijah McNier. He is a veteran war correspondent with 35 years of experience in Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Sudan, Afghanistan, and Yugoslavia. Amazing pedigree. Um, Elijah, welcome to the show. How are you doing this morning? Hello. Thank you for having me again. Absolutely. I am always enamored um, and impressed when I read through the areas. So war correspondent in and of itself is amazing. But to have it in all of those particular regions, exceptional. Um, I want to get your take. I want to pick your brain on the issue with Turkey because it is fascinating to me. Erdogan is a guy who often plays the West against the East. He seems to know his weight in a particular region. Finland and Sweden desperately want to be part of NATO, which is bewildering to me, considering neither of those countries are a threat, but whatever. But from their standpoint, they're basically saying, look, we have a wish list of things that we want to do. But they're also now talking about an incursion into Syria. It says the operation in northern Syria to be carried out by the Turkish army would allow Ankara to take 600 kilometers of the border under control and minimize the terrorist threat there, the Turkey newspaper reported on Friday, citing military and diplomatic sources. So Turkey is basically going to invade Ukraine, uh, Syria. Explain how this works. I mean, Syria is a sovereign nation, for one. And what is NATO going to do about this, considering they know that they want Finland and Sweden in NATO, and if they say anything against Turkey, it's going to make that that much more difficult? Well, actually, the situation in Syria is quite complicated uh, because there are the Turks and there are the Americans with their European allies who both occupy the northwest of Syria, that's for Turkey, and the northeast of Syria, that's for the Americans and the European Special Forces who are deployed in that area. And they have uh, uh, several uh, military air bases, and they control the major uh, food and supply uh, field, and also the oil and gas field under the control of the Americans. So what Turkey wants is Turkey wants to take a part of Syria, and that was uh, President Erdogan's dream since 2011 to annex Aleppo, Idlib, and the north of Syria. However, the uh, decision of the Russian and, the, and their allies, the Iran and the Syrian government, and the Syrian government, determined to recover Aleppo, that the most um, important industrial city spoiled Erdogan's uh, plans to uh, annex that city. So he moved to the northwest and with the blessing of the Americans managed to take one of the biggest uh, Turk uh, Kurdish province, Afrin, uh, and occupied it and installed in that area the, uh, uh, the, uh, the his, uh, Syrian proxy, including Al-Qaeda, and there are the Islamic State ISIS there. Al-Qaeda has a different name now. In Syria, they are called the guardians of the revolution, the, sorry, the guardians of the religion, Rasuddin. And uh, what he wants is he wants to push the uh, Syrian refugee. He has four millions in Turkey. He wants to push one million and a half into the area that he dreams about annexing and take. 30 kilometers from uh, the far west to the far east to the uh, Syrian-Iraqi borders. Now, this is not going to happen for several reasons. First of all, because Russia, the Syrian, and the Americans are operating in that area. Secondly, because uh, the uh, Americans don't have plans for Syria at the moment. We see that President Joe Biden and his administration followed exactly the same path as President Donald Trump and doing nothing but stealing the oil, controlling the area, not moving because they don't have really plans. Uh, they should just withdraw and pull out 
and end their occupation and the theft of the oil and gas and allow the Syrian government to prosper as they have all agreed that it is impossible to change the regime. That's one of the regime change that has failed uh, for the Americans. And Assad has been re-elected and he's going to stay in power. However, this was not enough convincing for the Americans to please the uh, Israelis to make sure that perhaps they can try a Kurdish state there linking the uh, north of Syria to the to Kurdistan area in Iraq and create the state for the Kurds. And this also didn't work. So at the moment, as nothing is working, they are staying there, but they certainly not going to give it to President Erdogan. The Russians have increased their presence. Now we know, the world knows, that the Turks have blocked the access of the uh, for the Russian to supply their men in Syria because of the war in Ukraine, and they closed the space, the airspace. However, Iran opened its, its airspace to Russia, and the supply of, uh, of equipment and men for the Russian is coming through Iran, and Russia is increasing its presence in Syria. Although there is a very good and strategic relationship between Turkey and Russia, however, they disagree on uh, Syria and uh, they uh, disagree on the sovereignty of Syria. Russia insisted that Syria should not be divided, and President Erdogan uh, dreamed of taking a part of Syria and a part of Iraq as well, but that's another topic. So he wants also Mosul and he wants Kirkuk, where there is the oil again, and he believed that these are also part of the 73 Turkish provinces that he's entitled to recover as he has lost it, uh, not him, but Turkey has lost it during the Ottoman Empire. So the Americans will find a way to please Turkey because it is very important for them to increase the number of NATO countries from 30 to 32 by including Finland and Sweden. They can't do that unless all the 13 uh, nations, parliaments agree on the uh, new incoming, and uh, they need the Turkish approval. Uh, Turkey has other demand in uh, regaining the F-35 uh, jet program with the United States that was suspended because Turkey uh, uh, was engage with uh, the S-400 missiles, the Russian S-400 missile program with Moscow, and that upset the Americans, and th therefore they've suspended the F-35 program. And they also put an embargo on all the F-16 spare parts that Turkey has. So for that, Turkey has something else to ask in the exchange of the impossible demand of annexing the north of Syria. Elijah, I'd like to shift gears a little bit um, over to Ukraine precisely. Uh, there's, I'm getting reports from my friends in Moscow at RT that one of the reporters that, that I know um, just, just moments ago narrowly escaped death as the, they, they're a caravan of reporters, including reporters from Reuters, um, a caravan of reporters, civilians, going through Severodonetsk in the east. Um, the car in front of the RT team was either hit, either hit a landmine or was struck by something. something. The driver of that vehicle has passed away. The Reuters, the Reuters uh, journalists were injured, taken to hospital. Uh, the RT reporter, who I know, uh, Igor Zhdanov, uh, he says he and his crew are fine. Uh, luckily, uh, but this is not being reported in the mainstream press that it appears that Russian press are being, Russian and Reuters, I mean, I don't know where the Reuters people are from, uh, this team, this particular team, but uh, given that, Elijah, that you have been a war correspondent in, you know, in the middle of a hot war like this, how do you feel about hearing something like that where this is, this is what uh, Zhdanov wrote he says, at first it looked as if they hit a landmine. The car flipped over and caught fire. The driver died on the spot. The journalists were hospitalized. Our crew is fine. And then he goes on to say, they, 
that it's this is his impression is that they had waited for us to drive on the road which as it turned out had been shelled before and only then began the shelling using a drone to adjust the fire both our vehicles were civilian how do you how do you feel about that given that you have been a a wartime correspondent for so many years well, actually, this is a, an awful feeling. I've been through that in 1982 during the uh, Israeli invasion to Lebanon, when I was uh, just the day about to go inside Beirut, just a few hours before the beginning of the attack against the city. And the Israeli officer did not allow me to go in, but to one small road. And he said, you take this road if you want to go in. And I walked in. And I saw many people dead on that road. I couldn't understand what was happening uh, until I arrived on the other side and suddenly people jump, or armed people jump and say, how on earth do you come on this road? It's full of mine. So oh. sometimes officers and people who are uh, fighting in the war, they deliberately indicate uh, journalists who are reporting the atrocity of one side or another and they want them to uh, go and be killed because they don't care really. And our job, we are armed with our pen, our phone today, and computer. In the past, we didn't have neither phone or computers. And it, it, I have so many other stories. I was arrested also in uh, Bosnia during the Yugoslavian war. I was shot at by a, sn in a sniper alley. Uh, when you are wearing a very clear sign of being a journalist, uh, was arrested for three days. Uh, so the stories are endless and all that because there is no respect for our job to bring the truth to the world and allow people to judge for themselves what's happening. By targeting journalists is really something that we cannot describe because our job taking a risk to inform people is our duty and it's something that we don't do it for money because nobody can pay you for risking your life to be on the front. We do yeah. it we, yeah. out of uh, passion, out of uh, desire, out of um, objective to inform people what's happening, make clear that people have the right stories. And then it happened. It happened a few weeks ago uh, also in in, in, uh, in Jerusalem when... Uh, where Shereen, in. Yeah, I was sitting here looking at that story right now. I mean, the problem is, yeah, it's like you guys have a philosophical responsibility to, to give what's true. Yeah, but the, oftentimes when countries are in war, they don't want that. The, the sad thing is Reuters, who is supposed to be a, you know, a neutral news agency, a news outlet, yeah. they have not commented to RT, who has asked for comment because, you know, they were. it's a caravan of different reporters, yeah. right? Like oftentimes... Um, what happens when you go overseas, and Elijah can attest to this, you stay in an enclave of press, oh, right? Basically, to, you're together. Right. You stay together, and you're, you're very clearly marked as media. Um, and I guess the car ahead of the RT crew mm -hmm. was the one that got struck, and Reuters people were in it. And the driver, I don't know, it's unclear right now if it was a, a Reuters person or if it was like a local driver. Yeah. But the local driver the was pronounced dead. dead on the spot. Wow. Um, and the Reuters team was injured. Reuters has not responded. Yeah. I mean, I could only imagine that they are not speaking to this is because it would shift the narrative. Or is it just new? It's not that new. But I actually was, you know, before I got in here this morning, mm -hmm. um, I got a text message. It was like several hours was, ago. Right. So when I woke up early this morning, I, I the text message was already on my phone. Yeah. So that means it's it's happened already, like many hours ago. And we know, do we know as and a certainty that it was Ukrainian forces that fired on? Like, is it just that, that they had... well, Zhdanov hasn't Igor Zhdanov hasn't said specifically who. Okay. But he's unclear what took place. Basically, I mean, he just knows right. something happened where that car exploded. We thought it was a mine. We don't think it's a mine now. Right. We think something is. He said dodgy. he thinks there's something a drone related related incident. Yeah. Um. And and obviously, you know, it's the fog of war. You can't tell what's, you know, who's firing where, mm -hmm. um, but... Looks like there would be a comment. Something said by right. Reuters. Right. Reuters hasn't said a thing. Elijah, from your standpoint, several of the Mets, um, my, from my understanding, the overwhelming majority of it is captured. And yes. so those troops, Russian troops at this point, are going to be within range of Kramatorsk, 
um, Slavians, where they can basically use artillery once again, something that they've been using almost like a, you know, like a genius level um, use of, of artillery. As morbid as that sounds, it's war. So it's kind of is what it is. From your take, what's taking place on the ground? And what does this mean um, that they have access at this point, or at the very least range of Kramatorsk, the area where the majority of uh, the Ukrainian forces are basically held up? Well, it means that as President Zelensky admitted yesterday that he is losing 20% of the Ukrainian territory, that 125,000 uh, square kilometers are under the Russian control today, and it means that he is uh, he's, he's losing the finance, he's losing the capability of uh, keeping the country together, and he's delivering the country under the American control. He is not realizing, or perhaps he did, he is, but he doesn't have any more the choice, neither the uh, will or the possibility to take the situation in control or in hand, because the decision makers are the Americans. Right. But there is something else here. Now, it is obvious that Russia is not going to stop until the objectives are reached. There is no time frame for this operation. What is interesting here is how long this war is going to last and who is benefiting from this war. Is the Americans really so clever in keeping this war ongoing? I mean, if we look at the cost that you just said a while ago, how everything has become so expensive. And the Americans are not realizing that what Henry Kissinger said the other day, give Putin the tranquility he's asking for and stop this war because it is not in the advantage of the Americans and certainly not the Europeans. We see that the a report coming out from the British intelligence saying that Russia is not winning but is achieving its objective. The contradiction is either they think we are completely stupid or they are because if Russia is achieving its objectives, it means it's reaching the target that they want and the goals they have set for. Now, who's paying the price? Europe is paying the price. Africa is paying the price. America is paying the price. The whole world is paying the price because the price of oil and gas is increasing and everything else follows. So at the end of the day, the Americans are supplying the Ukrainians with weapons and they're going into a very dangerous game here by supplying weapons that potentially, if they supply the advanced version, can reach uh, Moscow. If that happened, then the Russian will supply the American enemies or opponents or, for example, Latin America with enough missiles to reach any point in the United States. So is this what we want? This is the level of escalation we take in the war. I mean, financially, Russia is not paying the price because as the uh, report coming out from Russia that Russia has made in the last four months three times more than the amount Russia made in 2021. So there is a lot of money coming in into Russia because there is a price of oil that is increasing. The objective in Donbass are, uh, are going to be reached and we'll, there is only one city left in Lugansk and then the concentration will be on the rest of Donbass. And that is not difficult. But to prolong the war, this is what the objective of the Americans that is forcing NATO and Europeans to do so, this is against the American interest, is against the world interest, and it is rendering the world less safe and much more expensive. And today Putin is meeting with the African delegation to say that he is ready to supply them with wheat because Russia is the biggest producer of wheat, not Ukraine, and it produces 23 to 24 percent, while Ukraine 8 percent. But the Americans should remove the sanctions on the Russian ships and should, mm -hmm. the Ukrainians should allow to remove, should remove the mines from the sea so more ships can navigate and carry the wheat outside the Black Sea. Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, Elijah, right now there's a, a four-party conversation happening. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the UN. Um, Turkish diplomats are reporting to Anadolu news agency 
um, that these talks are happening uh, to try to export out 20 million tons of grain from both Ukraine and Russia to hit global markets. Uh, but they're looking to try to facilitate uh, safe passage, as you said, that they, they need some sort of insurance. And you bring up a very good point about the, you know, this next round of sanctions. There's sanction after sanction. And it seems like the, the Western governments are not acknowledging that their choice in going down this path of sanctions. And we've seen, you know, whether it's sanctions on Iran, sanctions on Venezuela, that these sanctions, like every other list of sanctions, hurts and cripples everyday people. It doesn't hurt the leaders of whatever country you're sanctioning. It hurts real people, regular civilians. At what point will they either A, stop these crazy sanctions, or B, at least work out some deal where if, we're, if there's going to be some kind of punitive measure, that it's not taken, you know, that's something that's going to result on hurting the people. Now, you're absolutely right. All the sanctions imposed, unilateral sanctions imposed by the Americans or by the West hurt all with the people. And they are illegal because they are not imposed by the United Nations. Now, because we agree that the world is a jungle now, and the one who has the power is the one who decides. So we have these sanctions that cripple the population. We've seen that in Iran. We see that in Syria, in Venezuela, and in elsewhere, wherever countries uh, try to contest the U.S. hegemony. Now, to stop the sanctions, if I just uh, try to um, come close to that, how the Americans can stop the sanction and say, We've been wrong all the way since the beginning of the war. How the European can stop the sanction, and they are the one who are paying the price of the war in Ukraine. First, they're still buying gas and oil from Russia. Secondly, the price went from 70 to 119 dollars a barrel. But three, the Europeans have agreed to pay 9.5 billion dollars to Ukraine the other day, and Ukraine needs billions of dollars every single month. So all that is drying out the European asset and is drying out the world asset. Now, how you can impose punitive sanctions on Russia when the ruble has, uh, is better and stronger than it was in 2015? Now, uh, the uh, uh, Russians are getting much more money than ever before for selling a high price of oil and gas. The demand is extremely high. China, uh, that was not announced, but China is really buying everything that Russia uh, needs to sell if the Europeans are not buying. And at the end of the day, if uh, the Europeans are saying, we're not going to get this oil and gas by the end of the year, or perhaps 90% of the oil, maybe Russia will switch to send all this oil to another market, and then what is going to happen to Europe? So, so all these punitive measures are useless and are having a boomerang effect on those who are imposing these sanctions. It's a simple fact. Africa is starving. The, there is wheat. Russia has wheat. Ukraine has wheat. India is falling back because of the dry season uh, they're suffering from, but not for, from the war in Ukraine. Allow the navigation of ship to flow from Russia, at least carrying wheat and carrying food to the rest of the world, and stop this madness because it is affecting the population and not the leader, as you really rightly said. Elijah, thank you, my man. Always appreciate it. Very your, well put. Yeah, extremely well put. Elijah Magnier, he's a veteran war correspondent with 35 years of experience in Iran, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Sudan, Afghanistan, and Yugoslavia. You can follow Elijah on Twitter at EJMALRAI. And you can find his reporting on his website, ElijahJM.wordpress.com.